examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Aldo Leopold Welcome to Voices of the Wilderness. I'm Jeff Ryan. To say that Aldo Leopold was a giant in American conservation history seems deficient. Over six decades in the 1900s, this remarkable man influenced or entirely redefined the ways we look at our relationship with the land. He was responsible for the creation of the world's first wilderness area. He created the profession of game management and was a champion for maintaining habitat for waterfowl and game. He was among the first to recognize that watersheds extended beyond stream beds and river banks and to see every landholder's stake in keeping our waterways healthy. He was one of the eight original members of the Wilderness Society, an organization that would become the leading force in establishing wilderness areas throughout the U.S. He was the first to bring the concept of land restoration into the public consciousness. Leopold and his family embarked on an experiment to reestablish woodlands and prairie on their own hard scrabble Wisconsin farm. In 1949, Aldo Leopold's life's work culminated in the publication of a collection of essays entitled A Sand County Almanac. In it, he put forth the notion of a land ethic, saying that we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. The more I wondered how Leopold's land ethic came into being, the more I realized I needed to jump into my van to go visit the places that shaped his views and to talk to the people who knew most about his life's work. Our story begins in Burlington, Iowa. I am glad that I will not be young in a future without wilderness. Aldo Leopold yeah, well, when you're trying to understand Leopold's life, there's no way to fully understand it unless you're grounded in the places that he knew and loved and that influenced him so deeply. And first and foremost among them is his childhood home of Burlington, Iowa, which in terms of its natural and cultural features was ready-made for a young man of his uh, inclinations. So in terms of the natural setting, you have this amazing spot along the upper Mississippi River with the bluffs looking out over this vast floodplain, which was still a wild place at that point in his his life in the eight, late 1880s and 1890s. So he had a chance to grow up in an area that was for the Midwest as it was in going through this epic conversion um, through the late 1800s was still retaining that sense of wildness. Is also a place rich in history, including, of course, the Native history, which was still present. Uh, we forget sometimes in how recently the Native people of Iowa were still, you know, they're living, it's a living memory at that point, and, of course, uh, and remains so. Um, but the cultural changes going on in the Midwest, which Leopold's family exemplified uh, immigrants from Germany primarily, who uh, opened up, as we used to say, the area, and his grandfather, who helped to set the stage for that that process by bringing hundreds of people over from the old country. But with his deep appreciation of the natural world, that was really a part of the family legacy. Um, all through the generations, there had been this love of land. Um, in fact, uh, there's a story that uh, the family home farmstead, it sort of was a farmstead because it was an old orchard area, but it was rapidly becoming part of town in Burlington. That the, the family name for it was Lugensland in German, which means look to the land. And so, you know, what could be more appropriate for Aldo Leopold to literally be looking to the land from atop the bluffs in Burlington, Iowa. So um, combine that rich family cultural appreciation of the natural world um, with the setting in which he found himself and it was ready made for, for 
Leopold to absorb lessons of adventure, of curiosity about the way nature works, and of sense of responsibility, which is especially coming through his father, Carl, um, whom he would later uh, memorialize as a pioneer in sportsmanship. So long before there was a conservation movement, all those father had this sense of, of moral responsibility for their sustaining of the natural world. And Leopold grows up a very active kid in the outdoors, especially fishing and hunting on the Mississippi River, and absorbs that sense of ethical responsibility. Um, he probably would not have known what that meant at that stage in his life, but it was part of his, his early upbringing and his psychological makeup. So at that formative age, Aldo Leopold was definitely influenced by his father, who was a very enthusiastic outdoorsman and who was quite adamant about ethical behavior in the field for sportsmen, which is, of course, it's really when ethics come into play. When you're out there alone, no one's watching, uh, are you going to do the right thing or the wrong thing? So from a very early age, Aldo Leopold was imprinted almost with this idea of ethical behavior when you're in the out of doors. Yeah, of course, we as people are responsible for the natural world that sustains us. There was, of course, the field of wildlife ecology and management it didn't get invented until Leopold himself would do that, help to do that uh, decades later. The conservation movement even had not yet coalesced. The term conservation wasn't even widely used yet. But Aldo's father, and others, he was not alone, but um, as we saw, as they saw, the decline of wildlife populations, um, they understood that change had to come to the culture of hunting, moving away from the old free-for-all of market hunting to a sense of, again, personal responsibility for conserving the world that can saves us, serves us, uh, protects us. Um, and so, yeah, these kind of uh, very personal ethical codes for how you ought to conduct yourself in relationship to the world around you becomes part of his, again, his early framing of an ethical outdoor appreciation of nature. So Leopold is coming of age at a time when natural history has a, was the cutting edge science of the day, understanding the diversity and functioning and and beauty of the natural world. Um, through the 1800s, it was a golden age of natural history and a young person like Leopold uh, was able again to benefit from that really widespread cultural appreciation of science, not as a distant um, way of understanding the world, but simply as a channeling of curiosity. Our job is to sharpen our tools and make them cut the right way. The sole measure of our success is the effect which they have on the forest. Aldo Leopold. His professional career, of course, took him first to the U.S. Forest Service, um, where as one of the first wave of professionally trained foresters, he was responsible for the management of literally millions of acres of wild lands in the newly created national forests of the Southwest. And I think it was during that phase of his life that he translated the ethics of sportsmanship in the field to thinking more about the ethics of your behavior with respect to the natural world. Um, and Leopold, and this is where the, the tenor of the times meets the, uh, the psychological intellectual makeup of this young man. He was the most curious human being I've ever encountered, um, alive or not. Um, all you have to do is look into any of Leopold's archival records, and you can see this man was, uh, he was curiosity personified. And not only knowing the pieces of the natural world, the plants and animals, soils, waters, and so forth. He was curious about the human history of our interaction with the natural world. He was curious about people and what drove us and what our value systems help us 
to uh, appreciate or not uh, in our interactions. So he was a deeply and lifelong curious human being who just wanted to understand how the world worked. Mm -hmm. But he took it beyond that to say, even if you understand how the world works, that's not where it ends. It doesn't tell you how you ought to relate to it. That's where the ethics training comes in. You mentioned his father. Um, his father ran a furniture factory, a very successful outfit uh, in Burlington, a center for making office furniture. And if you look at the logo of the uh, company historically, their, their, uh, their, their description for themselves and their own ethic as a business was built on honor to endure. That's what they stamped into their furniture. That was the, that was the uh, we call it a mission statement now, <laughs> of their company, built on honor to endure. And I used that in, when I worked, the, worked on the biography because that seemed to capture this family spirit of uh, looking beyond mere economic dollar value to understand that anything we do, whether in business or in our recreation or in our spiritual lives or in our aesthetics, involves this ethical appreciation. And so that was, again, part of the family ethic that would grow over Leopold's lifetime into this broad, comprehensive philosophy of conservation called the land ethic. And it came, of course, in the context of Aldo Leopold as a public servant. He was responsible as a supervisor of national forests. He was responsible for making decisions about how those national forests were going to be managed. And of course, because the national forest system was new at the time, uh, people like Leopold, who were visionaries, perhaps had a, a disproportionate influence. But of course, he was in a bureaucracy and he was a supervisor. So his personal views of what was right or wrong to do in these wild lands of the Southwest got translated essentially into regulations, into policy. It was a very bureaucratic, top-down sort of way of thinking about our responsibilities toward nature. So his initial thinking about what eventually became the land ethic was framed in this kind of restrictive regulatory framework. Well, this is Leopold's great characteristic as a as a human being as a character as a as a historical figure is his capacity to grow this is what attracted me to him as at first as a scholar as a conservationist myself though it's also a real admirable trait watching him grow through his triumphs and his defeats through his growing scientific understanding through his growing capacity to work with many different kinds of people and to meld all that um, this curiosity we talked about, all of this goes into his, his evolving as, as a person. You know, a friend of mine has a phrase for this. He says, conservation isn't a set of policies or laws. Conservation is a journey. And it's a personal journey for everybody. And Leopold is a really great historic exemplar of that. Watching him navigate um, through his own personal hard times through his intellectual understanding of how nature works. The Southwestern landscape could not have been, again, a better place for him to try out his own uh, evolving ideas. Understanding landscape change in this sensitive, semi-arid landscape of Arizona and New Mexico, and Northern Mexico as well. Um, culturally, again, the uh, most important story and relationship of his life is his marriage with Estella who comes from a different cultural background. She's coming from the old Hispanic tradition coming up through Mexico and in New Mexico. And the fact that he marries out of his Midwestern European, Northern European background and understands that there's many different ways of seeing the world and interacting with it and being humble is probably rule number one. Um, and so the Southwestern landscape again, both culturally and ecologically, um, becomes a place for him to continue growing through his work as he understood the complexity of ecological change and the complexity of human relationships. Aldo Leopold spent nearly 15 years working for the U.S. Forest Service in New Mexico, 
During those years, he became convinced that some pieces of wild land should simply be left alone. In 1921, Leopold lobbied his supervisors to create a continuous stretch of country preserved in its natural state. Three years later, as Leopold embarked on a new phase of his career in Wisconsin, he got word that his proposal had been accepted. The Forest Service set aside 750,000 acres of desert, rivers, and mountains in New Mexico as the Gila Wilderness. It was the first area in the world to be designated and protected as a wilderness, and it set the stage for the creation of wilderness areas in the decades to come. The destruction of soil is the most fundamental kind of economic loss which the human race can suffer. Aldo Leopold. And when he gets promoted um, in 1924 and moves to the Midwest and gets stationed at the U.S. Forest Products Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin, he, of course, finds himself in a totally different context for thinking about the ethics of our relationship with nature. He's no longer in an environment that's dominated by publicly owned land in which state or federal agencies essentially made decisions about how the land was going to be used. He was no longer in a place where there was even very much wild land left. Most of it was privately owned working lands. And the landscape, certainly in the upper Midwest, was dominated, of course, by agriculture, by farming and by forestry but taking place almost entirely on privately owned land. So Leopold's thinking about the ethics of our relationship with nature now had to evolve Mm -hmm. into a completely different context. And if we explore his writings, you can actually trace his evolution as he goes through the mental process of thinking, how do you induce somehow conservation on privately owned land. What does it take to get a private landowner to, in Leopold's words, preserve the public's interest in things like water and soil and wildlife that you don't technically own? Mm. It's part of the public trust. And initially, perhaps not surprisingly, given his background in the Forest Service, his first thought was, by gosh, we'll make them do it by regulations. That had worked for him. And um, he quickly, of course, figured out that that was not going to cut it with the private landowners of the upper Midwest. They resented being told what to do by anyone. Um, It's my land and I'll do what I please on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Leopold quickly had to sort of turn his attention away from the first tool that he had in his toolbox, which was regulations and start thinking about alternative ways to get private landowners to uh, engage in conservation. And after he quit the Forest Service in 1928, he spent three years on a contract job doing a wildlife survey of the upper Midwest. He toured extensively, looking at the status of wildlife populations, talking to people who were engaged in conservation activities at the time to get the sense of conservation policy and legislation. And he came back from those three years of looking at conditions on the ground with uh, a very new view of what it was going to take to get conservation on this predominantly privately owned working landscape. And he made it a priority to communicate with anyone and everyone. And it starts with his own family again, but it's his students. It's the general public. In the case of here where we are in Wisconsin, it was the agricultural community because he was in a college of agriculture and his part of his job was to be talking to landowners and typical smaller farmers at that point in Wisconsin's history. He was well known among Wisconsin farmers. Right. He's talking to hunters. He's talking to bird watchers. He's talking to urban people. He's talking to rural people. He's talking to wilderness aficionados. He's talking to hardcore businessmen. Every day he's reaching a new audience. And at the very heart of that is as he matures, because that 
poetic lyrical writing we remember him for really is a late flower. Mm. Mm. It's only when he's 50 years old that he starts writing that way, which the joke has always been there's hope for all of us. Yeah. Um, but what he's trying to do especially is to convey why this new emerging science of ecology, how it explains the world, or at least helps us understand the world, why that was so important to citizens, to students, to foresters and wildlife managers, to government officials, to simply the average neighbor and person who wants to understand and get maximal enjoyment. Leopold saw all of those different constituencies and understood that this new science, which had its own vocabulary and its own specialized way of understanding things and describing things, he was a translator, and he had to be a translator because no one knew what ecology was. Mm. And again, as we unfold his story of his life, this becomes more and more and more important. And he realized right off the bat that the, the central problem was habitat. <clears throat> it was basically how private landowners were treating the land mm. that was determining how the status of wildlife would be determined. Um, so Leopold is at a point where he has to start thinking now about how do you get this done? And in 1933, big year for Aldo Leopold, a very big year, uh, he publishes a blockbuster book, Game Management, that introduced to the world this new idea that sprang largely from his experience doing those game surveys of the north central states that you can actually manage wildlife by manipulating habitat as opposed to the prevailing paradigm of the time which was wildlife needed to be protected so up until 1933 when leopold publishes his book if you were engaged in wildlife conservation you were a game warden you were there to enforce laws, right. not to manage wildlife. Right. You were there to basically protect wildlife. Uh, but after 1933, the paradigm shifts largely because of Aldo Leopold to this idea of wildlife management. And for the first time, people who were employed in wildlife conservation became wildlife managers rather mm -hmm. than just game wardens. So 1933 was also a big year because that's the year at the University of Wisconsin creates a special chair in game management for him. A really almost unthinkable sort of thing for the university to do. You have to imagine 1933, still the end of the depression, the university's budget must have been really lean, and yet the dean of the College of Agriculture decided to offer a faculty position to this guy who had no graduate degree, had never taught a course in his life, and who represented a field that had never before been present in the halls of academia. But Leopold got the position, and right off the bat, he got an opportunity to engage in an experiment. And it was part of the Roosevelt sort of era of conservation, which was largely based on providing government subsidies and government incentives to landowners to do the right thing. And Leopold, was part of the nation's first watershed management project, the then brand new, so then called the Soil Erosion Service, now called the Natural Resource Conservation Service. But one of their first projects was to look around the country for a really damaged watershed and put some experts to work on figuring out how do we get this watershed back in shape. And they picked a watershed in western Wisconsin called Coon Valley um, as the watershed, and they gave the task of figuring out what to do to the faculty in the College of Agriculture at the University of Wisconsin. And Leopold, so even though he was then the, the new man on the block and definitely low man on the totem pole, he managed to play a significant role in shaping the direction that that project went from a strictly agricultural engineering project of how do you build check dams and do contour plowing to thinking more about the ecosystem in a holistic way. Um, 
what today we would call ecosystem management. And the Coon Valley Project definitely went in that direction, largely because of Leopold's influence, but it was an experiment in using incentives and subsidies to basically coerce private landowners into doing the right thing. It was, uh, it was the carrot rather than the stick of regulations, mm. which seemed more amenable, you might say, to the prevailing attitudes about property rights and, and so on. So the Coon Valley experiment was Leopold trying out a new tool to see whether could we actually get private landowners, farmers for the most part, to create and maintain habitat for wildlife on the farm if we give them some financial incentives and some help uh, to get it done. And it looked really promising until the project ended and Leopold learned a painful lesson. And that was, it works as long as the subsidies and incentives continue to flow. Once they stop, many individuals will go right back to their old ways. A lesson that we still have to learn today. Our tools are better than we are and grow faster than we do. They suffice to crack the atom, to command the tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history, to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. Aldo Leopold. In 1935, Aldo Leopold and his wife Estella announced to the children that they had bought a farm on the Wisconsin River not far from Madison. The property was worn out due to over-farming, and Leopold and his family set out to rebuild the land. With five children, it's interesting. Uh, we have stories from each of them about their time, their own memories of their father. And so often you, you ask one question and you get six different answers from five children. One story that was exactly the same from all of them was their first experience at the shack. Their father had come home, said they bought this new place on the Wisconsin River. They come up here on a cold February day. They, they drive in, they get out. All that's sitting there is this little ramshackle building. They open the door. There's chicken and cow manure frozen waist deep in it. And their dad asks, well, what do you think? And they say, we all thought he was crazy. They kind of all pause there. They give their mother a lot of credit uh, and saying, it can be great. Let's get to work. And so what did they do? They started cleaning it up. And right. from there, they then started planting trees and prairies and hardwoods. And now is, in fact, one of the earliest examples of ecological restoration. And as you say, an international icon for this sense of a land ethic and living lightly on the earth. On this sand farm in Wisconsin, first worn out, then abandoned by our bigger and better society, we try to rebuild with shovel and axe what we are losing elsewhere. It is here that we seek and still find our meat from God, Aldo Leopold. They would plant 3,000 trees a year, uh, 1,000 white pine, 1,000 red pine, and 1,000 jack pine. Uh, remember the first five years, the drought and dust bowl was continuing to, to kind of linger here in the upper Midwest they lost almost 100% of all of those trees. Mm. In my family, we would have quit at year three, but no, year six, they come back out, they plant another 3,000 trees, uh, they try some different techniques, the climate begins to change a little bit, the trees start to take root, and uh, now you can see the, the fruits of their labor. During the years Aldo Leopold and his family planted prairie grasses and trees, his land ethic continued to evolve. So. He's in a quandary uh, by the mid-1930s. He basically has recognized that we can't buy enough land for conservation. We can't do conservation just on publicly owned land. There's not enough of it. We can't get people to agree to do things by regulations and subsidies and incentives are tools, but they're not the silver bullet, essentially. So at that point, he's, he's, the toolbox is pretty empty. That's all that conservationists were working with at the time. And Leopold comes to the realization that what we really need, going back to his ethical thinking about public lands and his ethical thinking about his own personal behavior as a sportsman, what we really need is a new ethic 
We need a new moral compass, essentially, for private landowners. And it is essentially out of this cauldron of conundrums about, you know, how do we get conservation done? And the fact that he was trying to do it on private lands, that the land ethic really evolves. He thinks that this is going to be the way forward. We have to get private landowners to think about not only their own private interest, but the public interest. And the public interest is in waters and soil and plants and animals that occupy uh, their land. And the way that we can get them to do the right thing on their land is to have what Leopold called an ecological conscience, mm. a personal sense of what's right and wrong to do. And as he said in one of his more quotable quotes, it, it's hard to make a man by pressure of law or money do a thing that doesn't spring naturally from his own personal sense of right and wrong. And that sense of right and wrong is the essence of Leopold's land ethic. And Leopold quickly seized on community, that humans are used to living in human communities. And everyone understands that if the human community is going to be healthy and thrive and function well, there has to be a set of ethics, a code of ethics, essentially, that all of the individuals that are part of the community adhere to. And if that doesn't work, sure, you can have regulations and you know punish people by the law, but basically everything works a lot more smoothly if it is coming from people's heart. So Leopold translated that sort of common understanding to an ecological community and said, just as the same way that you live in a human community, whether you recognize it or not, you live in an ecological community. And the members of that community are the other elements of the natural world that share the land with you. And we have responsibilities toward those other members of the community in the same way that we have responsibilities toward the other members of the human community that we live in. So it's kind of a brilliant formulation on, on his part. And he will spend essentially the last 10 years of his life thinking about this, refining his thinking, writing essays about how this idea is sort of taking, taking shape in his own mind. As he's working through this collection of essays, he didn't know it was going to become a book. And it's one of the oddities of history that he never even knew the title, A Sand County Almanac, this book that becomes a transformative book for conservation. He didn't even know that title. So we have to put ourselves back in his time. And he's struggling with everybody to understand what the heck is happening to our world as right. global conflict takes over. And he has several of his, two of his sons are involved in the war effort. You know, right. it's a very direct and personal thing, even as he's thinking about the global human condition. Um, but what does he do? He doesn't, again, yeah, tell you what to think. And it's ironic that he's remembered for the land ethic, especially which would seem to be, oh, this prescription of how we ought to behave with the natural world and our relationships. Hmm. Well, you know, he was doing his best to frame what he understood an ethic to be. Um, and the irony is people remember him for that. But again, uh, the point I've often made is that if you read the essay, he says, no one writes an ethic. Right. An ethic evolves in the minds of a thinking community, and we're all invited to be part of that thinking community. In fact, we all have an obligation to be part of that thinking community. And so Leopold is doing his best. He's making his own final uh, conclusions or uh, summary judgments as best he can. But then at the same time, he's inviting us because he knew that that's what it would take to keep it alive and vital and right. growing and evolving as our world evolves and as our social and ecological relationships evolve. Um, Leopold couldn't give us the answers to the dilemmas we face now. Um, we know a lot more um, scientifically. Uh, we have had many streams 
of discussion about ethical relationships from various traditions, everything from Native American frameworks of thought to the global religions, wrestling with what it means to think about our human relationships with the creation. Um, and, but Leopold was there framing it for, for us, not telling us how and where we're going to go, but telling us how to think about it and provided an example himself. And at the heart of that is, yeah, stay curious, stay respectful of relationships, try to incorporate an understanding of history into the way you think about things, consider our traditions of justice that have guided us since civilization began and evolved uh, and, and have evolved. All of this in very simple language uh, gets layered into his writing in a way that allows us not to see him as a distant historical figure, but see him as an early framer of these big questions we still answer. Right. And so he's not the only source. Uh, we, are, we have a great wealth of rich thinking on these complex issues from so many different traditions. But what Leopold's special contribution was, was to come up at that point in history and tie the scientific understanding to the ethical understanding, and then again provide this personal example of it in his own way and with his own uh, very intimate landscape and his own personal relationships. And of course, it all reaches its culmination, really, um, in his book, A Sand County Almanac. I do not imply that this philosophy of land was always clear to me. It is rather the end result of a life journey. Aldo Leopold. Aldo Leopold's collection of essays entitled The Sand County Almanac was published after his death and went on to sell over two million copies worldwide. Leopold didn't live long enough, of course. He died tragically at age 61, just uh, shortly after he'd learned that the book was going to be published by Oxford University Press. So he never got to see the impact that his book had. Um, and it's, it's an interesting story because initially it didn't have much impact. The book had been rejected by a number of publishers who all pretty much said the same thing. We don't think there's any readership for this type of book. And Oxford University Press clearly took a gamble and published it despite knowing that the other reviewers, the other publishers had basically said, the second half of the book is pretty dense. The philosophy, the ethics stuff, nobody's gonna be interested in that. Um, and they were right. Mm. The book was a bust through the 1950s, hardly sold at all. And it wasn't really until 19, the 1960s, 1966, when Oxford University Press, I always say it was either brilliant marketing or dumb luck that they came out with a paperback edition of a Sand County Almanac just at the right time when the modern environmental movement was suddenly launching itself. And suddenly, 20 years after Leopold had written The Land Ethic as an essay and published the book, Sand County uh, Sand County Almanac, uh, suddenly there was an audience right. ready to read it, ready to be inspired by Aldo Leopold's ideas and ready to adopt his land ethic as essentially the ethical foundations of the modern environmental movement. In terms of the big arc of conservation history, yeah, we have Leopold there as a pioneering young guy in forestry, which was the cutting edge of conservation. He pushes beyond that to talk about watershed, restor uh, watershed protection and restoration, about wilderness lands and wildlands and protecting wildlands. He goes on to you know, develop wildlife management as a new field, a new, whole new branch of conservation. But then even beyond that, um, coming to the Midwest and realize, look, we have pretty much transformed this landscape that, again, he was a product of as a boy. There wasn't much prairie left in, in his own state of Iowa, which was almost 100% prairie. And he didn't, and it was already almost gone by the time he was born. Mm. But just what, 30 years later, 40 years later, he, he's part of this radical new idea that conservation isn't just about protecting 
special places. It's not just about sustaining economic resources. It is also about taking the responsibility for restoring lost ecological diversity and function. And that is an entirely new branch of conservation that now, uh, almost a century later, we are still um, developing, even as the global environment goes through rapid change. So these lessons from Leopold's life of, again, growing personally, but also growing with the movement for all these different stages um, is part of what makes him a fascinating figure. And on this particular aspect of ecological restoration, what's interesting to think about is it's very, it's an important new area of research and, and, uh, and demonstration, uh, as he did uh, down at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum, where he took his new professorship. And this was a key part of that, was to work to create the first prairie restorations in the world. Mm. But then also the very personal and intimate level of doing it right here, right where we're sitting on the family's own land. And so another key dimension of Leopold's legacy and his continuing relevance is He's thinking of all this stuff <laughs> all the time. He's every minute he's alive, I think he's thinking about human relationships with land and how to change our institutions to make conservation real. On the other hand, he's also doing it very personally with his own family and his own hands on his own small piece of a pretty degraded landscape. Right. And that that's part of the I think the really the magic of Leopold's story is he's He's at the forefront intellectually, globally. There's very few other people in his generation thinking at this level. But he's also doing it in the most personal way and direct way possible. And so he's living it and showing it as, as part of his own personal commitment. And that connection between sort of the abstract and intellectual and the concrete and local um, is really uh, a special part of Leopold's story. I have purposely presented the land ethic as a product of social evolution because nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the minds of a thinking community. Aldo Leopold. The subject of our relationship with the land has never been more important, and Aldo Leopold's writings are just as relevant today as they were 70 years ago. We are so fortunate to have people come here daily again, from all over the world that, you know, really are invested in committing to building this relationship, building a land ethic. And so it's a, it's a pretty amazing place to work to have folks like you and, and others arrive on site and uh, interested in the history, but, but as importantly, what it means for the future. I'm Jeff Ryan. Please join me next time for another episode of Voices of the Wilderness.